so this idea was, all right, let me look at a burr house hat combo. I got to have all the like creature comforts that's going to make the girlfriend, future wife happy. And then the other thing we knew is we weren't going to live in New Orleans forever. So we wanted to find a place that was a double or a duplex. And in the perfect scenario, had like a guest house or a pool house. Welcome to the House Hacking Success Podcast, where you'll learn the path to free rent and financial freedom through real estate. Featuring your hosts, Brad Labrie and Drew Klingler. Hey everyone, real quick before we start the show, Brad wrote an amazing ebook that will teach you everything you need to know about house hacking and living rent free. To get a free copy, text house hack all one word to 22828. That's house hack all one word to 22828 to get your free copy. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Uh, we're thrilled you're here. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me on. I uh, took this sort of alternative path early in life. You know, back in high school, I drove my parents crazy because the classes I loved, I had an A, close to perfect, like 98, 99, 100. The classes I didn't like, I basically got a 70. I did just enough to pass. Uh, so with that in mind, I never went to college. And at the age of 19, I stumbled into the mortgage industry and started doing really well. Bought my first house at 20. And after spending six, seven years in the mortgage industry, was making great money, burnout on life, you know, not happy, that sort of whole story. And then mm -hmm. from there, I stumbled into the nonprofit industry. Didn't make any money, but really loved the work I was doing, was really happy with life. And then I had this sort of epiphany of like, this is what I want to keep doing. I want to keep doing the nonprofit work, but I got to make more money. And I sort of leveraged my community developments skill set that I was building in the nonprofit background, along with my mortgage experience in the mortgage industry, and dove headfirst into real estate investing and built up a really big portfolio over the years, did everything from long-term buy and hold, flips, private money, and uh, just sort of dove headfirst and built this nice real estate portfolio to help fund my retirement so I can keep doing the nonprofit work that doesn't pay well. Very cool. Doing real estate investing, uh figuring out a way to do the thing that you want to do. So it's a really cool story. Um, so I know you've done some house hacks. I know you did your first one at 20 years old. Could you tell me a little bit about that and how you found out about house hacking at 20 years old? Yeah, so I'm 37 now. So at 20 years old, house hacking, you know, it wasn't even a term at the time. <laughs> I just knew I had moved out right after high school and then moved, my lease came up, moved back into my parents' house while I was starting to look for a new roommate. And I just realized, I said, you know, I'm in the mortgage industry now. I'm doing loans for folks. I can qualify for a house. Why am I going to go pay $800, $1,000 a month in rent when I can buy a place and have a mortgage payment, you know, right around the same thing, eight, 900 bucks a month. And then I could get a roommate and they can cover part of my mortgage. So this idea was just, why go do this when I can go buy a house and have reduced housing costs? So that's a, what I really did is I ended up at 19 years old. Once I had a full year in the mortgage industry, started looking for properties mm -hmm. and found a house, bought it when I was 20. And what it was, was this end unit townhouse that had a first floor master bedroom and two, two bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs. So my idea was I could live downstairs. I could have the downstairs to myself. And then upstairs, I could put one or two roommates up there. They would share the bathroom. So then the only thing we really have to share is the kitchen space. And I had several friends that were paying four, five, six hundred dollars a month to share a two bedroom place. So to me, it just sort of made sense of, yeah, let's go do this. I can reduce housing costs and hopefully you get appreciation. They're paying down the mortgage. You know, you get your interest right off. So to me, for some reason, it just made sense. It wasn't really house hacking at the time. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's how I sort of stumbled into it. That's really cool. And so you continued to do that. Uh, I know you got one in a college area. Could you tell me how you found that and how you financed it? <clears throat> yeah. So the, the first one, you know, I bought, I think I lived in there four, five, six years. I ended up selling it. And then as I was traveling a lot overseas with the nonprofit industry, I sort of realized, you know, I'm living in a place, I was renting an apartment, living with friends, and I just wasn't ever there. I was gone months at a time. So then I transitioned to living back with family 
And then I said, you know, why don't I go back to doing that sort of thing that I did but before, but try to find a place that has more room so that way my, my housing is sort of cost neutral. So over by North Carolina State in Raleigh, North Carolina, there's a lot of these four bedroom, four bathroom condos that you could rent by the room for 350, 400 a month. And I saw a couple that were foreclosed on or short sales. And I started negotiation, negotiating with a bank and did an FHA loan, bought one for like $90,000. My mortgage payment all in was something like six, 700 bucks a month. You know, I, I put uh, the three and a half percent down, the seller paid the closing costs. And I realized I could rent the three other rooms and was bringing in nine hundred, a thousand dollars a month, and my mortgage payment was, you know, well, well below that. And it was perfect for me. You know, again, this wasn't house hacking; really wasn't a thing at that time. But I realized I was doing disaster response work. I would get deployed to Indonesia and be gone for weeks to months at a time. So it just didn't make sense for me to pay even four hundred dollars a month to rent a room. And not be there for eight, nine, ten months out of the year. So that's how I sort of landed on this four bedroom, four bathroom place. All the individual uh, bedrooms locked, so you only had to share the common space. I know it would be always super easy to rent because there's college kids around. I was in my sort of late twenties at this time, so it was just a really big fit. We found it on the MLS, did FHA financing. You know, I got into it for for nothing. Didn't really need any work. There's an open room that I could move right into and ended up living in there for a year. So it was a really cool experience and re really beneficial for me financially, because at that point I was just starting to invest more in real estate and was still on that nonprofit salary. So I didn't have a ton of money and that allowed me to save more money to invest. Very cool. And, you know, like you said back then, house hacking wasn't even a term or probably not talked about as much. And you found a way instead of paying rent to get paid to live there a couple yeah. hundred dollars a month. So that's pretty amazing. And you yeah. said you rented by room. What were the challenges of running by room? Luckily, you know, a lot of the big challenges are, you know, you got to do individual leases, room rental leases. You got to find tenants that are fine with living with somewhat random people. But in a lot of college towns and especially there in North Carolina, there's multiple sort of condo apartment developments that were geared towards room rentals. So the biggest hurdle was finding someone that rented by the room, but college kids were already used to that. They were in a mm -hmm. tiny dorm where they're moving out and sharing a big house. So that was pretty easy to do. And I only had to do it for a year. And luckily I inherited the three tenants. So, you know, a lot of the big obstacles that folks face when they're doing a house hack or even finding tenants for a long-term rental I didn't have. And then when I moved out, I put in a property management company that took it over for me. Very cool. Yeah. So your uh, third deal, it was a burr slash house hacking kind of deal. Is that correct? Yeah. So those first yeah. two house hacks, I was really sort of new diving into the real estate realm. <clears throat> I'd end up uh, moving out of that second house hack, running it. I was living in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, had the opportunity to move down to New Orleans where my wife and I just really love the city. And at that time, you know, I think my portfolio was up to like 40 units. I'd done several flips, done some wholesale deals, started to invest in some syndications. I said, all right, I, I'm, I want to do something really, really creative. And this was also my wife's first house hack, sort of our first deal together. Real estate had always been my thing. So I was trying to convince her to get involved with this. I'm, we're going to move to New Orleans. We're going to move in together. You know, we weren't married at that time. We were pretty serious. So this idea was, all right, let me look at a Burr house hat combo. I got to have all the like creature comforts that's going to make the girlfriend, future wife happy. And then the other thing we knew is we weren't going to live in New Orleans forever. So we wanted to find a place that was a double or a duplex. And in the perfect scenario, had like a guest house or a pool house, because what we knew, we wanted it to be a long term rental in the end. And we wanted to be able to come back to New Orleans and always have sort of a little pierre de terre that we could crash in. So that guest house that we could rent out short term while we're living there. But, you know, when we moved on five years down the road, we'd always have this guest house. So we could come back for Carnival, Mardi Gras, Jazz Fest and have a little place. So when we moved to New Orleans, we rented a place. We spent about probably six, seven months looking before we, we found a, a property. And it was pretty sort of funny story where I think it was listed at like 350. I put in a low ball offer. They didn't take it. 
I was then traveling. They did a price drop. Someone else got it under contract. Uh, they did like a 40,000 price drop. So I actually came back in, put in a backup offer. Meanwhile, my wife didn't know I was doing this. And she basically uh, came back and I said, look, I put in a backup offer. They might accept it. If you're not interested in doing a house hack here, I'll just buy it with my LLC and I'll turn it into a long-term rental. That caused some uh, <laughs> conflicts there in the relationship. But then luckily, the person buying it uh, was uh, just a married couple. One was a lawyer, one was a doctor, and there was just so many problems with the house. You know, it was a 90-year-old place, broken sewer lines, had some mold issues. And as a real estate investor, that just got me excited. I was like, oh, other people's problems, I can fix that. They ended up canceling out. We got the deal. And what it was was this old 1920s corner store. So it has the canopy on the corner. And we knew we could convert this into several apartments. So what we did is we converted into three high-end apartments, a two-bedroom, one-bathroom upstairs, a one-bedroom, one-bathroom, and then a two-bedroom, two-bathroom downstairs. And then it had this old barn building out back that we converted into a one-car garage and a little two-story loft space that would be our then guest house. Um, and we really created into this sort of nice space that the wife was comfortable with. You know, we have original hardwood floors restored. We got marble bathroom, like 70 gallon deep soaker tub in our unit, uh, tile floors. And then we got the lovely guest house that fen friends, family and stuff stay in. So it's this really cool combo that we did that we then went and refinanced after to pull out a majority of our, our cash. And now we're living in this sort of higher end space. So it ended up working out really well. Awesome. Real creative way to house hack. And I think it's really cool too. You're talking about having that guest house so you can come back to New Orleans yeah. and travel there. That's something we never really talked about on the show. And it kind of sheds some light on what you can do with house hacking. And if there's a vacation location yeah. that you really like, you could house hack there and have a vacation home. To Absolutely. Go to and not have to pay the expenses on it. So that's really cool. Yeah. One of the things now people always feel like you have to make a big sacrifice to house hack. But if you get really creative, you can come up with really cool scenarios. It takes more work to get it done. And sometimes you need a little more experience or willing to go outside your comfort zone. But I had a really strict criteria, had to be at least a duplex. And I wanted some sort of accessory dwelling unit on the property. And then I had all this other sort of thresholds I had to have to please the wife. You know, she wanted the farmhouse sink. She wanted the nice soaker tub. You know, it needed to be really high end, good area. It worked out great. I mean, we've got within flat five blocks, like a Walgreens, we've got restaurants, we've got a grocery store, awesome. we got a live music venue, you know, the street cars two and a half blocks away. So this was a really, really big project. I think our net price was like 270 and we put about a quarter million dollars into uh, the, the renovations, but you know, we did it with hard money lending and then refinanced out to uh, lo longer term 30 year fixed financing. So it took a lot of work and took a lot of creativity, but we, we felt like we didn't have to sacrifice on anything that we wanted. Great location, all the amenities mm -hmm. and all the fixtures and stuff to please the wife. Cool. And, you know, the nice countertops, the good bathtub, all that kind of stuff, probably good for you long term. You're going to get higher quality renters. You might be able to rent higher, too. So it might have been a little bit more upfront, but maybe yep. long term it pays off. Yeah, our, our two downstairs tenants pretty much cover all of our mortgage and then the majority of the taxes and insurance. And then when we rent out our, our guest house during our Mardi Gras, you know, we get $200 a night during Mardi Gras for this little 500 square foot place. Um, and that covers uh, the rest of it. So we actually end up making, you know, between four to eight grand a year uh, on that house hack while, while we've been living in it. Awesome way to do that. Very cool. Yep. So that was your third house hack, correct? Yep, that was number three. So your fourth one, um, that was also a uh, burr slash house hack kind of deal. Uh, yep. Can you tell me a little bit about that one? Yeah, we just closed on it in October. Um, so we, again, we sort of wanted a property that I really like. A, a lot of the bigger syndication deals I invest in are our multifamily value add. I really like that strategy where there's not a lot of things we can control. Real estate, you do get a lot of control and especially value add there's that opportunity to really control increasing the value of the property. So at this point, you know, in my real estate investing career, already reached lean fire. 
I'm okay not making as much cash flow as long as I can sort of add big chunks of value or, or equity to my, to my net worth. So we wanted a little bit more space. You know, the apartment we've been renting from ourselves, it was a two bedroom, one bathroom, 900 square feet. So we were looking for sort of a three bedroom place that we could have. And what we wanted to do was have it in an equally cool location. And we probably spent eight, nine months looking for this next place. I mean, we actually had a deal where we were under contract in May and the property flooded, you know, three days before closing that we had to back out of. So it took a long time to find this one, but it's in a great location right near the French Quarter. It's a duplex. Uh, same thing, it's another 90, 100 year old property, but each side was about 1,100 square feet, three bedroom, two bathroom. And the really cool thing about this property, that sort of value add piece that we saw was there's this unfinished attic space that could add about another four or 500 square feet. It took a, will take a little bit of modification, but I knew everyone else that was walking in was seeing it as storage. I saw it as here's four or 500 square feet that I can finish out and then add to the property. And that would automatically, you know, if I could spend a hundred dollars a square foot building out that space, I knew that would bring me 230, $240 a square foot in value. So basically double the money that I invested in that space and sort of same thing. Wife wanted to have a really nice area. So we closed in October. We did an FHA loan again. You know, my previous FHA loan for my second house hack the property had been sold quite a while ago. So I had the ability to do that again, even though we had tons of cash on hand, we wanted to have that cash for the renovation. So we're going to use the FHA. You know, I think we had to bring 20 grand to the closing table all in. And then, you know, we'll probably put a hundred, hundred twenty thousand dollars into the property, uh, fixing it up, getting it renovated, and then we'll refinance out of it in a year once all the work's done, increase the value, and pull out, you know, 80, 90 percent of our, our cash from the property. But again, you know, not sacrificing cool location. We're adding a whole master suite upstairs in this property. My wife is getting a walk-in closet that's like seven feet wide, 14 <laughs> feet nice. long. Like she's in heaven. So, um, yeah, we closed in October. We're, you know, one of the great things in New Orleans or downside is the architecture. But anytime you modify the exterior properties in a historic district, you know, it's going to take us about two months before we can start work because we have to submit to a historic district. They sign off on it. Then it has to go to an architectural review committee. They have to then sign off on it. And then we can finally get our permit from the city and start doing work. So that whole process can take, you know, 60 to 90 days before you can actually start start doing any work. But yeah, so we're hoping to start work here in December and then, you know, be finished with it in March. But the great thing is there's a tenant on one side. So we'll renovate the vacant side, the whole exterior. Then we'll move in to that other side. And that tenant that's in there is covering about 80 percent of, of the mortgage we just got to cover that little bit extra, uh, but we've got the cash flow from our third house act to cover that. So it's not costing us any money out of pocket. And then when we move in, increase the mm -hmm. rents on the tenant on the other side, you know, it'll essentially be about cost neutral for us. But we'll have gone from a 900 square foot place to a 1500 square foot place. Cool. And then you have all that equity that you're going to be able to pull out and use that as leverage. Yep. You know, maybe for the next property, whatever you decide to do with that, but really cool strategy. So doing uh, four house hacks, what have you learned along the way? And uh, what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that you actually have to do is really look at what are the needs for you and your family? Obviously, if you're single, that's the best time to house hack because you don't need a lot. But really sort of sit down and say, <clears throat> what are the must haves for the family? You know, when my wife and I were talking about my third house hack, our first deal together, she really had some sort of must haves our needs sort of changed for this fourth house act. So figure out what you need and then use that as a idea to form the type of property that you're going to look for and that type of house act that you're going to do. So whether it's a room rental or you're buying a property that has this unfinished basement mother-in-law suite or the accessory dwelling unit, there's so many different ways to do house act. But if you figure out your sort of need first, what's the needs for the family, then you can sort of build the ideal house act that you need to start looking for. So if you start there, that's a great place to do it. And then the FHA loan is the easiest way to do it. I mean, the, 
again, I, I, I just mentioned it. We did, we're doing it for our fourth house act. We had enough money to put 25% down, but why deplete our cash on hand when we can use that for the renovation and, and the value add portion? So even if you don't have, you know, a huge money for 25% down, you know, use the FHA uh, loan for the three and a half percent down or the 203K where you can build in some of those renovation costs. So, you know, that's sort of my big advice is figure out your needs and then find the ideal house act to fit those needs. And you actually don't have to make a lot of sacrifices either. Yeah, absolutely. And what I found, if you find a move in ready place, I mean, it's the same process as just buying a house with added on finding the tenants. Yep. And, and that little extra work with those tenants is so worth it to have maybe a $200 mortgage or cost neutral mortgage. And uh, I think it's a great strategy that can really open up the world to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, even if you can't get to cost neutral, I mean, most people spend a third of their income on housing. I mean, some places like Chicago, New York, San Francisco, they're spending 40 to 50 percent. So, I mean, I was talking to a guy out in San Francisco, his more his rent is twenty six hundred dollars a month. And he's looking at doing a house act where the mortgage would be twenty nine hundred bucks a month and he could rent out an extra room in there for a thousand bucks a month. Now, that's not like the absolute perfect scenario, but, you know, for him, if he can drop his expenses from twenty six hundred to two grand, you know, that extra six hundred dollars a month lets him max out a IRA for the year, which he wasn't doing anything for retirement. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I, there, there's so many opportunities that House Act can open up for you, whether it's saving for kids college, trying to save for retirement. So, I mean, even if you can reduce your housing costs by twenty five percent. Um, to me, that's still a great opportunity. You know, the other thing I always like to mention to folks is a lot of folks feel like house hacking is the first step to being a bigger real estate investor. And it really is a great way to dip your toe into it. But even if you never want to get into real estate investing, I think everyone should do a house hack, right? I mean, because it just opens up so many opportunities for you. Yeah, absolutely. It gives you a lot of freedom to reinvest, like you were saying, into maybe an IRA instead of a real estate. Yeah. Or even just eat out more, go on more vacations, pay off uh, student loan debt if you got student yeah. loan debt like myself. But uh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so you mentioned uh, FHA loan, 203K loans. Is there any other type of financing that you would advise to use? Yeah, definitely don't rule out hard money. A lot of times if you find a really good property that needs a lot of work and it won't qualify for an FHA financing, don't be afraid of hard money. You know, for my third house hack, we used hard money. Uh, to basically buy the property and cover a majority of the rehab costs. We still had to put up a lot of cash, but that was a great way. And then at the end of the year that we had all the work done and our 12 year balloon was up on the hard money, we refinance out to the 30 year fixed mortgage. So definitely don't rule that out. And then if you're fortunate enough to have someone in your network that has a lot of free cash, you know, look at having them do a private loan. I mean, that's a great way to do it. I've had never mm -hmm. done private uh, money for house hacks. I've done it on other deals. So it's always a great opportunity if it's out there. But yeah, two, the 203K, the FHA loan, that's sort of the standard default, but there's a lot of options out there. Very cool. I know you've done a couple of 1031 exchanges. Yeah. Uh, could you tell me what, well, for our listeners, explain what a 1031 exchange is. And then also tell me about your experiences with them. Yeah, so the 1031 exchange basically lets you take a investment property, roll the proceeds, your, your gain over to a new property, a new investment without having to pay taxes. So it's a great way to sort of kick the can the road, kick the can down the road for those taxes. You know, in 2016, I sold off a 24 unit affordable housing portfolio. Part of that I owned solely on my own, and then a couple other pieces I owned with some um, silent investors. So what I did on the piece of my own, I rolled one building, four units into three other properties. So I had probably about 80,000 in gain on that property. So if I would have had to pay taxes, you know, between federal and state, you know, I would have owed 15, 20 grand in taxes. So what I was able to do is roll those proceeds, that profit into a 1031, I didn't have to pay the taxes and then use that one property to buy three more properties. So it's a really cool opportunity to avoid paying taxes and sort of keep building up in your portfolio and stepping up to that next one. And then the most recent 1031 exchange I had was actually a failed exchange. Um, I was selling a property 
in uh, North Carolina had massive appreciation. It had almost doubled from when I had uh, bought it. It was a really good solid rental. So what I did is I knew it could sell it quickly. I could put it up on a Friday and be under contract by Sunday. So I knew I would sell it. So I said, let me start looking for a replacement property first. And then I could put this on the market afterwards versus most, most folks will say, I'm going to sell the property. I'm going to list it. Then I'm going to start the 1031 exchange. So luckily I found a new property, went under contract on it, immediately listed my property in North Carolina to sell that sold quickly. Money went into the 1031 exchange, but then we had all these problems with this new property where it flooded three days before closing. So then what happened is I canceled that deal. We broke the contract, got out of it. Um, and then my clock ran out on finding a replacement property. So then I ended up sort of having a failed 1031 exchange and had to pay the taxes on it, unfortunately. But, you know, it's a, a great opportunity when you can make it work. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't even know that you could roll that into multiple properties. Like yep. you said, you, you sold one property, bought three properties with it and didn't have to pay the taxes. Like I always thought it was just from one property to another. So yeah, as, that's, as that's really as amazing to learn your debt stays the same or greater and your equity stays the same or say or, or greater you you can roll in a 1031 yeah when most folks say the same thing like oh i thought you could only do one to one and i said well no i had so much growth where i could take all my gain and all the equity that had been built up and use that as a down payment on three new properties and then my debt i i, I use leverage but it was 20 enough to have 25 percent down on three other properties so it was a cool way to leverage up and buy more properties yeah, that's that's quite amazing. So uh, you've been to court, it looks like, multiple times, uh, 20 evictions. Yeah, I'm reading. Yeah. So uh, could you tell me a little bit about that and what new landlords should know? And should they be scared off from that or? Yeah. So the, <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of good stories. So, you know, I would been doing aid work. You know, I did work in places like Haiti, Indonesia, Philippines, very developing countries, very poor countries. So I primarily invested in college housing, just being in my 20s and then now in my 30s. I just felt comfortable relating with folks in college. I said, great, I can deal with it. If you get mad, be a drunk frat bro and punch a hole in the wall, I can fix that, no problem, easy <laughs> stuff. That didn't bother me. But then I found there's this really cool niche where investing in sort of C-class properties, the sort of lower income areas. It was a really easy way <clears throat> to invest lower price points. You had really good ratios on your price uh, to what you could get for rent. But the tenant base had this very different mindset and most folks didn't want to deal with it. But since I had been doing that sort of community development, rebuilding work in very poor countries around the world, I felt completely comfortable in that area. So as I started building up this affordable port, uh, housing portfolio, I built this sort of goal of trying to find the top of the low income bracket. And in that process, I bought a lot of properties with inherited tenants. I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt, say your old landlord was a slumlord. You know, he didn't fix anything. You just saw in the first 30 days, I did new roof, new windows, new siding. I fixed all the deferred maintenance. So you've got, you know, a new chance, you know, you're back right with your own landlord. I wiped it off wipe the debt off the books so you have a chance to sort of move forward and positive. But I'm really strict on rent, really strict on leases. If you're not paying on the first, you're getting the notice right away. And over that process, what happened is I realized some tenants just can't get their act together. You know, no matter how hard they try, they try to take advantage of the system. Um, so instead of paying a lawyer to go do evictions for me. I said, I've got a lot of time. I can go do this. No problem. So I ended up representing myself in 20 plus different evictions and never lost a single eviction. I had one guy appeal just because he knew how to work the system. And mm -hmm. then I had to go get a lawyer to represent um, me in the appellate court uh, there. But to me, it was a really easy process. As long as you have really strong leases, I used, uh, I, and I still use, it's um, landlordforms.com. They have okay. leases for all 50 states. Um, they have lawyers that actually put together the leases. I essentially built ironclad leases, and that was an advice that I always give the folks is have really strict leases. And even if you want to give people leniency where, you know, rent's due on the first and the late 
you know, charges, say, maybe on the 5th. If you want to waive the late charge, if they pay on the 6th, that's fine, but still deliver the late notices on time. Because when you go to evict a tenant, though the way and timing you deliver those notices run out a certain clock. And it's different for every county and every state. But I was really strict on delivering the late notices. That way, if they did caught up and I want to be a nice guy and say, great, that's fine, I would do that. But if they didn't, then all of a sudden I was I didn't have to restart over that clock of delivering like a pay and quit notice. So have really strict and ironclad leases and then enforce the leases and deliver your notices properly. And if you do all of that, most folks that you do need to evict, it's because they don't pay or they violated the lease. And if you have those ironclad leases, going to court was actually really easy. You know, I'd show up, dress nice, I'd put on the suit, I'd talk with a lawyer and, or the judge, and I'd say, look, you know, here's the lease, they broke it, I delivered the notice on this date, I delivered the notice on this date. You know, here's the email saying it was delivered. Here's a picture of me hanging the tag on the door. And he'd say, great. And then ask them, why didn't they pay? And they make up all sorts of excuses. You know, I had a hard time or he was being an asshole to me, whatever <laughs> it may be. And the judge would just say, well, he documented everything. He did it exactly by the book. Sorry. You know, you're out. He wins. So it was a really overall easy process. But I had to deal in that affordable housing C-class area. You end up having to deal with a lot of um, evictions, but I still make great money on it. Uh, you just got to have those really good leases. Okay. Very cool. Uh, and that's a great example too, just documenting everything and you're sticking to the lease and making sure that you have a great lease that yeah. you're not treating this like a hobby. You're treating this like a business and it's working out for you in that case. Yeah. That's where a lot of people mess up in real estate is they treat it like a hobby and they don't treat it like a business. No matter if you have, you know, one tenant, one rental, or you've got a hundred, you know, from day one, start treating it like a business. Yeah. Develop those good habits early. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what are your long-term goals in real estate? Yeah. So I have essentially sold off all my units. I think at the peak, I got up to about 40 units. Um, the only property I solely own now is my third house hack and my fourth house hack, you know, on bigger pockets and a lot of other places, there's this mentality of, you're not a successful real estate investor unless you own a hundred units or a thousand <laughs> units. But what I realized as I went through my late twenties to early thirties to now at 37, you know, I don't want to manage properties anymore. I don't even want to manage property managers anymore. I'll manage some tenants if they're great tenants and sort of a higher end tenant. And I don't mind managing the tenants in my house hack, but I don't want to have this massive portfolio of that on my own. So Starting in 2016, I started rolling over a lot of my profits into larger syndication deals. You know, luckily I was able that at that point to qualify to be an accredited investor, so I could start investing in a lot of these bigger deals where I can still get those 12 to 16 percent target returns that I wanted to get. But I actually all now I have to do is manage a sponsor of a project who then manages the whole project, the contractors, the property managers, leases, all of that stuff. So that's been sort of my goal is to build this very large investment portfolio specifically in real estate, but it's invested all in syndications. And then my other sort of target is to do a minimum of 12 and a half percent return when I invest my money in real estate. And that lets me double my money every six years. So I got this really big set goal out there for real estate. And then the other thing that um, I really started doing in 2016 was investing outside of real estate. You know, I had 90% of my net worth in real estate back in 2016. So now I've been trying to invest in more in equities, bonds, you know, building up the Vanguard account and really trying to make sure I'm not, you know, 90% in real estate, but more 50-50. Okay. That makes sense. Just not all the eggs in one basket. Um, would you suggest for someone starting out, maybe try to be all in on one thing just to grow and then spread out as it gets bigger? Oh yeah. You know, I mean, I made, I made so much money early on in real estate. I made cash flow because we were doing a value add strategy. We built a lot of equity really, really fast. I made great money for my investors. So I would really say, Start with a house hack so you can cut your housing costs as low as possible or completely eliminate them. And now you've just freed up $500, $1,500 a month. Use that to start to buy a second or third property, ideally a small multifamily. 
put a property manager in place if you don't want to manage it. So now you're building some cash flow. So, you know, if you can get rid of your housing costs or drop those to zero, and then you can bring in a thousand or two thousand dollars a month in cash flow from rentals. Now, if you lose your job, you're set, right? You've got this, you know, housing cost is zero or close to zero, and I've got enough enough cash flow coming in to pay my basic bills so I won't starve. Now, all of a sudden, work gets so much easier if you want to keep working. And then after you sort of built that sort of basic financial foundation, then really start investing, you know, max out your retirement accounts, build a brokerage account, try to find some additional alternative investments. But yeah, early on, putting your eggs all in one basket or going heavy in real estate is a great way to build wealth or build financial independence. Awesome. Very cool. Well, we like to read a lot of books on the show. Um, I know you might like some books. Uh, what's your favorite mindset or business book? You know, there's always the, the good ones like the Think and Grow Rich, um, The Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki's book. You know, one that was really early on that helped change my mindset was, you know, Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. You know, those are all great to get you to start to think differently. You know, a book I'm reading right now is actually really good. It's uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. You know, he was a Holocaust survivor, he was an Auschwitz, um, and he was a psychotherapist. Uh, so it's a really interesting book on the human mind and mentality and having a purpose and meaning is why so many people were able to survive through the concentration camps. Um, it's also super humbling that we're like, my first world problems are nothing when you hear about these experiences that people went through. So that's a really cool book I'm reading right now, but sort of all about mindset. Very cool. Uh, what about a uh, real estate book? Yeah, you know, going back to Robert Kiyosaki's, you know, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, and the cash flow quadrant is great. Um, recently, probably in the past year and a half, two years, I haven't been reading a lot of real estate books, uh, more of listening to real estate podcasts, you know, Bigger Pockets podcast, your podcast uh, since you launched, been listening through that. There's another one out there, Cash Flow Kings, and then um, the one by Jake and Gino, it's like multifamily property. So I tend to listen to more real estate related podcasts now. And most of the book reading I do is more about lifestyle, mindset, br broader investing. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you for uh, coming on to the show. We appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it was a really good episode. Uh, where can more people find out about you? Yeah, my website is fibyrea.com. F-I-B-Y-R-E-I.com. So you started a podcast, correct? Yep. Yep. Uh, do, do you want to tell listeners about that? We'll send them your way. Yeah, sure. I appreciate it. Yeah. So we're actually launching December 30th. It's called the house hacking podcast. So now with my podcast and your podcast out there, I think between those two resources, anyone will be able to find out anything and everything about house hacking. So yeah, it's the house hacking podcast. We have a trailer up. Awesome. I can't wait to hear it. I know I'll be yeah. tuning in. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on to the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me on.